Hello, I'm V.V. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today with UNM American Study Professor and, and historian and now tenured professor, David Correa, who was arrested and jailed uh, last week, I believe, uh, for a time um, uh, at a, for appearing at what I would call a free speech rally at the mayor's office uh, protesting police shooting in Albuquerque. D David was charged... Um, with a felony battery of a uh, security guard, which video footage has revealed to anybody with eyes is a blatantly false charge and, and should be chucked out the door. Um, I know that you can't talk about the impending uh, uh, legal proceedings, but uh, we could talk a little bit about, about the surrounding issues, and I'd like very much to, uh, to have David talk about uh, his... his uh, moments in jail, 16 hours, I believe, which is a long, long time, particularly in that jail, which has been taking a lot of heat lately because of its unsanitary and probably illegal conditions. Um, we talked here the first time, this is our third, this is our third interview with David, we talked here the first time about his wonderful book called Properties of Violence, which investigates the relationship of violence to law as it relates to property. Um, but this is an issue that he's been interested in all of his, all of his academic life. We'd also like to talk today a little bit about, about the role that universities and professors who believe in social justice should play in a city like ours and a state like ours. It's great to have you with us, and uh, very interested to hear what you have to say today. Thanks, VB. I'm, I'm glad to be here as well. Anybody who's been around here uh, for a long time knows that the Bernalillo County Jail uh, has always been a problem, just like all county jails in New Mexico are. I mean, they are, you don't want to get in those places if you can help it. And then when they moved the darn thing way, way, way out of town, uh, there was a lot of worry on a lot of our, of our parts that there were, you know, out of sight, out of mind, and all kinds of, of nefarious uh, habits and practices and intentions could, that could take place. Uh, we know that the Bernalillo County Jail has been under scrutiny. So, uh, seeing as how you're the first person that I know of, uh, personally, lately, who's spent time in, in, that, in that lockup, I'd love to hear your uh, recounting of what actually happened. And I'd really like to get a view of what happened to all 13 of you, what your relationships were with the officers, how, how you were treated, how you were handled, and what it was like in that, in that place. Sure. It was uh, 16 hours. 16. Uh, we were in jail. <clears throat> we were arrested um, in the mayor's office, 13 of us. By the time we were arrested, um, they had called in every unit of the Albuquerque Police Department, the emergency response team, basically the riot police, um, and came up to the 11th floor to arrest us. Um, while K-9 and SWAT, the uh, combat equipped units, were swarming the building. Um, and they came because there were 13 peaceful protesters sitting on a circle, sitting in a circle on the floor of the mayor's office, reading from the DOJ report. That was what we were doing the moment that ERT, the emergency response team, walked in. We were arrested and brought down to the basement of the mayor's office building and brought through tunnels all the way over to the police department um, where we were placed in what police would call or anyone in the know would call hot boxes. Uh, these are um, paddy wagons that have been sitting in the sun with the heat turned on. And, oh and um, so imagine you're, you're taking a pizza out of your oven. Uh, that sort of heat that hits you, that's about how hot the wagons were. We were all thrown in there, including Nora Naya, who's 67, Jim Bose, who's in his late 60s. Um, I think that really famous by now photo of Nora Naya, grandmother, oh, yeah. whose nephew was killed by APD in the 80s. Uh, she's emerging from the paddy wagon. Um, she was screaming. You could see it in the photo. And it was because it was, uh, it was more than a sauna in there. So we were held in there for about a half an hour, even though we were driven only across the street in the paddy wagon. And we spent about three hours in cuffs in, uh, during the processing period um, before being uh, transported to BC MDC, the Bernalillo County Metropolitan Detention Center, as you point out, is nearly out to the Route 66 casino, right? Out of, out of sight, out of mind uh, would, would be the way that I would describe it. Um, you know, the APD cops who dropped us off there said to us before, they released us into uh, detention center uh, hands. Uh, if you think we're bad, these guys are the worst. 
That's what one of the officers said to me. If you think we're bad, they'll mace you and tase you at the drop of a hat. That's what one said to me. And then he walked away. Yes. And we were in there for um, another 13, 14 hours. Uh, some of, the, um, of those arrested were actually processed and brought back to the general population uh, where they were strip searched. Um, oh. we, we, uh, I was with a group of about five people who never made it back because uh, the facility is so full. There was no room in the back. Uh, and so we, we stayed in a, in a cell, in a sort of a large cell, a common cell in a holding area where we, we had a lot of opportunity to talk to a lot of people that were arrested. Um, you know, when you, when you engage in civil disobedience and you know you're going to jail, you prepare to do jailhouse organizing. So we were, we were jailhouse organizing and we, we talked to a lot of people who knew what we were doing, were, were appreciated what we were doing and told us, and we hope you start doing it about the jail too, because th if you think APD is bad, it's worse here. That was what they were telling us. Um, and one of the people that were, were, were was telling us was later tased and maced in that facility. Oh. Um, maced in sort of a general area so that everyone around him also was maced. One one person who was under arrest, not not connected with, with us, um, broke his glasses and was knocked oh. down. We talked to him the next day. Um, but, you know, I think that what we found was, um, you know, the pattern and practice of unconstitutional policing that the Department of Justice defines in the report on, it, on the Albuquerque Police Department really doesn't even go far enough. And, and I was invited to a Department of Justice meeting this past Wednesday. And I, I told them one of the things I learned in jail from a lot of the people arrested, three people who I talked to had been arrested that night and we spent time in, in a cell with, said that they were in jail for a warrant violation for the second time, that they had been arrested on a warrant, missing court date, um, and then they spent time in jail, they were released, they went home, and then they were quickly rearrested the next day or the day after on the very same warrant that they had already been arrested for. Yes. And a pattern that they said was routine, it happens all the time, right? They were driving a car that made a broken taillight, they were pulled over, there was a warrant for their arrest, they knew they were gonna have to spend time in jail, they go to jail, they get out, and the APD officers who had arrested them don't clear that warrant. And so they have that same car with that same broken taillight, Jesus. and they're arrested again and sent, sent back to jail for the same thing that they'd already been arrested for. And this was a, this was a routine story that we were told about. Yeah, right? no, um, we were released about 8.30 the next morning. Many of us had to post um, bail that we couldn't afford. Uh, we have a bail fund that we were able to use a, a bail bondsman. And we got out about 8.30 the next morning, uh, altogether about 16 hours in the Bernalillo County Metropolitan Detention Center. I suppose you were well-fed and, and uh, <laughs> well trained. Oh, God. So um, in, in general, um, were you sort of just tossed out? Was there anybody there waiting for you? Did you, did you have a ride home or did you have to hitchhike out, out from that place? I mean, I'm sure you didn't have to hitchhike, but, but the... Uh, I can remember in, in when uh, people were released when it was downtown. I mean, they really didn't tell anybody. They just, you know, let them out. They didn't have any money left. Uh, not that it was stolen necessarily, but you know, but they were just, oh my God, you know, what am I going to do? What did happen after you left? Right. Well, you know, I think unlike most people that we met in jail uh, that evening, uh, we knew we were going to go to jail that day. The, the thirteen people arrested planned to engage in civil disobedience, peaceful, nonviolent civil disobedience that would result in our arrest. And so we had a jail team uh, that stayed up all night. Um, comrades from the Answer Coalition and our lawyer Larry Cronin and family members were on duty all night long. They posted bond at the middle of the night. Uh, and when we were released, uh, we took the shuttle back. Have a nice shuttle, They'd bring you back to town. <laughs> Um, and we were released right across from the police station uh, where Ken Ellis, the fa uh, father of Ken Ellis III, the Iraq war vet who was killed by police, mm -hmm. was waiting for us along with family and, and supporters and friends. Um, and some, I should say some people got out earlier that didn't have to post bail, that were released on their own recognizance. So there was sort of a trickling of people getting out earlier from us. But we got out in, at 8.30 and there was people waiting for us and, and been working all night to, to secure our release. Um, and, you know, and, and, and in terms of the food, uh, well, we knew we were going to get those bologna sandwiches. And, <laughs> and uh, so we had bologna, uh, American cheese on white bread, uh, a very small orange and frozen orange juice. Uh, 
that's the meal that prisoners get in jail. I'm not sure where that comes from and who has that contract, but whoever it is, they've been doing that for years. Right. Many people in town are thinking to themselves, well, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? I mean, uh, what's, what's up? Why couldn't they do something else? Uh, why do you have to do it this way? Um, not that there's, uh, well, I mean, I guess it shows that there's a tremendous uh, uh, sort of forgetfulness about what, about what civil disobedience is all about and how deeply rooted it is in, in, a, in our nature of a free state, um, which, of course, is probably rapidly collapsing on us. But uh, what, what, were, what were your goals? And, and now, what are your goals? Yeah, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about why we're choosing this approach to, to peaceful protest. And, and let me start by saying I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, civil disobedience has a long history in uh, American political struggles for social justice. And our intention to engage in peaceful s in civil disobedience is, is part of that tradition. And many of the actions we've taken have explicitly connected to traditions of civil disobedience in New Mexico as well. And we're trying to be very uh, explicit about those connections. In other words, these struggles are not new struggles, and we're not new um, participants in these struggles. Many of the people have been engaged in the struggle for decades. Um, and, and so, you know, this, this particular approach, the sit-in at the mayor's office, was something that is an extension of the choices we made a month ago when we began to engage in civil disobedience. And that really be began with the, the Cinco de Mayo city council action, which came out of a, a real profound frustration with the way in which the city uh, administration, the city council um, was taking a very um, complacent approach to addressing this profound problem we have of police violence. It, 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 as I talked about in the last time we had an interview, this is a, an old problem. It goes back to the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And each time when these patterns of police shootings and killings emerge, we get um, reformist measures from the city or from APD that mollify some people, but always result in more killing and more people dying. And we couldn't watch that anymore. And, and it really, I think for many of us, we were galvanized by the shooting death of Armand Martin, the, the retired Air Force colonel um, who was killed last month. And, you know, his death, I think um, everything that is wrong with APD, all the deficiencies in APD described in the DOJ report were on display in his death. SWAT is a unit that's supposed to de-escalate the most dangerous situations. This is, the, this is supposed to be an elite unit designed not to kill people, but to, to de-escalate situations where they have suicidal individuals, people who are barricaded in their homes, people in mental health crises. That's their job. But as the DOJ report demonstrates, at precisely the thing they're supposed to do, they're most deficient. And so Armand Martin's life didn't have to end that way. He was in a crisis. He was armed. What, they, they took a military approach, um, seeking out targets and destroying them approach, rather than finding a way to de-escalate, firing flashbang grenades into his home. Uh, using, um, you know, microphones to blast <clears throat> commands at him, uh, tanks in the street, um, frightening him. And, you know, I, I've spoke to his brother who was on the phone with him and, uh, you know, pleading with him to put down the weapon and on the phone with him when he was shot and killed. Oh, right? So many inconsistencies Ooh. in what the police department said happened in that report. Mm. Um, and... You know, the video, all we have again, in terms of the video, is of APD handcuffing a man they just shot and killed. And so we, we were at a, we, we, we tried to hold a vigil for Armand Martin the day after. We didn't know his family in town at the time. I hadn't yet talked to his brother, Tommy Martin, who lives in Cleveland. And we tried to hold a vigil, but there was just too much frustration and sadness and, and anger, quite frankly, real yeah. frustration and anger that despite this promising DOJ report that was so damning, that there was nothing happening, that people were still dying. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to start, instead of reacting 
to start using civil disobedience to demonstrate to people that, you know, the gears of justice aren't working, right? These are gears of injustice and we have to stop them. Mm -hmm. And so we engaged in, in, the, in the, the city council protest in which we uh, served an arrest warrant, a people's arrest warrant to Gordon Eden. And to clarify that, that action was designed merely as a way to serve an arrest warrant to Gordon Eden, to, to connect our movement to a long history of Chicano movement struggle that has long used this tactic, this very provocative tactic of a, of a citizen's arrest warrant, which we called a people's arrest warrant. And we, we had no idea that Gordon Eden would run away like a frightened child. And we had no idea that the, most of the city councilors would abandon the chambers. We thought we were gonna issue an arrest warrant and, and have a momentary protest that might lead to a few arrests for refusing to leave, even though we'd be peaceful. Instead, it turned into an opportunity for us to have our own meeting, to take over the days and have our own meeting, which we did. And we did the work that they refused to do, right? We immediately passed unanimous resolutions uh, calling on the firing of Gordon Eden, voting no confidence in Mayor Barry and the Chief Administrative Officer Rob Perry. And then we passed an ordinance to create meaningful independent police oversight with the authority to subpoena and to discipline officers. Those are the things this city council should have done but can't do. And, and then the silent protest three days later at the next council meeting was also not intended to culminate that way. But suddenly there are these um, really draconian restrictions on free speech. Suddenly the city council is dramatically reducing the ability of people to engage in the civic life of their community. And so we stood in silent protest, which was exactly the opposite thing they expected of us. And they arrested people. Right? They, they hauled us out and gave us criminal trespass citations. And now thankfully our friends at the American Civil Liberties Union is preparing a lawsuit against the city. Now the the sit-in of the mayor's office was also a way to demonstrate that we don't hold the city council only responsible. The city council has not done their jobs. There are fantastic city councilors that desperately want these changes, but as a body, it refuses to do what's right. And likewise, the mayor's office. The mayor's office has done nothing. He didn't want the DOJ to come to town originally and now pretends like he supports this process. He refuses to meet with people unless they agree to agree with him ahead of time. Right? He has a, a, a chief administrative officer, Rob Perry, who runs the city like he ran the jails through fear and intimidation. And if you look at the videos of our sit-in, you'll see Rob Perry, arrogant and belligerent, trying to incite peaceful protesters. That is who runs our city. That's the man and that's the process he uses to run the city, fear and intimidation. And so we recognize what we're dealing with. We're dealing with people who don't care about democratic processes in the mayor's office. We are dealing with a city council unable to resolve this serious problem. And if we don't resolve it, more people will die. That's the history we know. That's the lesson we, we, we keep with us. And we daily work with family members of those victims who are just as committed to this process and realize just as much as all of us that if they won't do it, then we have to. And as peaceful protesters, this is the only way we know how. And hopefully on June 21st, Saturday, June 21st, when we hold our peaceful march to end police brutality, more people will come and join us in this peaceful struggle to finally do something about a problem that's been decades in the making and won't end without a popular movement to stop it. The way the media has talked about this, the mainstream media, I have to say, uh, is they've labeled everybody as protesters, not mourners, not uh, grieved parties. Uh, they've they've tried to sort of put a um, an impersonal, depersonalized label on people who have had probably the worst thing that could happen to a parent happen to them. They've lost their child, and all or their niece or their nephew or their spouse or uh, and and their siblings. And and this this kind of thing, of course, reverberates throughout a family, probably. Hundreds of people in the long run. Uh, it's a catastrophe that any parent has nightmares about. So, uh, but so now we have this this sort of picture that this is um, a limited number of people. But I know it's not a limited number of people, and I also know it's not a limited number of organizations. It would be great if we could sort of just sort of nail down who has been involved in this for as you know, for a very long time, uh, and, and uh, sort of give some new 
reality to uh, to the body of protest. You know, when I when I started covering the problem of police violence in Albuquerque as what I what I thought of as sort of like guerrilla journalism, <laughs> citizen journalism, right? um, as you mentioned at the beginning, I wrote a book about New Mexico's colonial history and thinking about laws in relation to violence. And I didn't realize when I started it that it would actually be a book that included histories of police violence right. in New Mexico and struggles against it, largely in the 70s, in Rio Arriba County and in San Miguel County. And so when I started writing about the issue in Albuquerque in 2011, 2012, I was I was attending rallies and uh, protests, and, you know, that included really only families of victims of police violence. And I, you know, met people like Mary Job and Ken Ellis and Mike Gomez and others. And I was I was trying to tell that story, but it wasn't yet a large movement. And I think what some in the uh, city's administration and perhaps in the press are trying to do is continue to depict it as this movement of angry protesters and some family members. Right? But it's a, a really broad coalition of groups and individuals. Um, and and so, you know, the march that we're going to have on June 21st, on Saturday, June 21st, we'll, we'll have representatives from groups like the Peace and Justice Center, the Southwest Organizing Project, the Answer Coalition, Act Now to Stop War and End Racism. Um, we've invited uh, clergy, and we had a, a, a planning meeting last night, and members from the faith community were there to talk with us about how to how to get their involvement in this in this movement. There, of course, are family members yeah. who are involved, and and people that have been involved for a long time. Los Jardines Institute, and Richard Moore, mm. who with the Black Berets, uh, along with Joaquin Luhan, Luhan and others, were struggling against this in the '70s. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of elders in our community that are involved, um, Unoccupy, Albuquerque, and other groups who are more recent are also engaged in the struggle. We have so many groups, right, and so many people that are involved that it's hard to, to list them all. Right? Yeah, no, there's there's no, no, so, no, many, no. so many people. And, and, I, and I think you're right. You know, we, have to, we have to recognize that this is uh, not a protest movement, but a movement for social justice. It's not um, a movement designed to try to... Uh, uh, rail against something, but rather to come up with something different. A, a movement about cre how do we create a community safe for everybody? Yeah. How do we live in a city without throwaway people? Yeah. What would that look like? How would we do it? And that's not an easy thing to do. And, and part of our efforts now, particularly the more provocative ones of, of civil disobedience, are really about trying to demonstrate in really dramatic terms what's at stake, right? And what's standing in the way of producing that kind of city, right? And, you know, I think if you ask anyone on the street um, and you say, you know, what do you think about the 1960s civil rights movement and the, and the, 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 the groups and activists and their tactics, and people would say it was a transformative movement in our, in our, in our, uh, in our, in our country's history, and those tactics were the tactics of courageous and brave people, right? And then if you ask them, what about these protesters at City Hall or the mayor's office? And it's, and it's, they're less sure. Well, I don't know, maybe they should go through official channels. They seem too angry, right? And I, I just want to remind everybody that there have been activists seeking recourse through official channels for decades. <laughs> there have been families seeking recourse through official channels for years, and those official channels serve the interests of the rich and the few against the many, right? And the most vulnerable in our society have no one representing their interests, or at least no one with enough, with enough political power to make a difference. And so this is a movement that defends those interests and, and highlights those and elevates those. We're interested in elevating those above the interests of those that have the most. And so we're... I, I could tell you that people like Councillor Don Harris, who at the Cinco de Mayo council meeting said to Mike Gomez, the father of Alan Gomez, who was killed by APD three years ago, that my constituents don't care about police violence and don't see it as a problem, said that to Mike Gomez at the city oh, council God. meeting. It revealed to us, and I think for a, to a lot of people, that it's not so much that they don't want to do anything, some of them at least don't, it's not that they don't want to do anything about the, the problem of police violence, but to them, it's not a problem. Yeah. That to them, there are throwaway people. To them, there are people that don't deserve, deserve justice. And it's those people that we're fighting against. We've got 
more things to talk about, but I want to ask you just if you can speculate a minute on what might actually what might actually happen with the DOJ report. What what's the worst case? What's the middle case? What's the best? I was at a DOJ meeting on Monday uh, of this week um, it, with community members. It was it was a meeting called by Jewel Hall of the Martin Luther King Memorial Center. There were at least 40 people from the community there. Uh, Damon Martinez, the U.S. Attorney, and Luis Salcedo, the, uh, the interim, I think the acting director of the Civil Rights Division that was really in charge of writing that damning DOJ report were there. Uh, they've been great throughout this entire process. And uh, if it wasn't for that report, um, I don't think we'd have the momentum that we have. Uh, but, but the DOJ can do only so much. And if we want to see what they can do, you could look at a place like Seattle, uh, who suffered through similar problems with police violence. And it took the DOJ and the city a year and a half just to complete the negotiations, to come up with an agreement to resolve the problems of police violence in Seattle. Now, the DOJ and the city of Albuquerque just began the negotiations yesterday. And in that meeting, we asked, how long is this going to take? And they said, as long as those those discussions are productive. So it, it could take a long time just to get to the point where we can begin to implement the changes described in the DOJ report. And we won't, as, as the public, we won't see what that consent decree, that legally binding agreement between the DOJ and APD regarding what changes they will make, we won't even see that agreement until it's completed. We asked Many people in that meeting on Monday asked for uh, someone representing the community to be in that meeting. And the DOJ said no, that they didn't believe that that negotiation could have any validity or credibility and that there couldn't be frank conversations in that room if there were community members also present. And this is not something they've ever allowed in any other negotiations with cities over the problem of police violence. So we, we, we didn't expect they would say yes. But, but I would say every single person in that room raise that issue at some point during a three and a half hour meeting. And they, they made it clear that that's not gonna happen. We also were really upset that Scott Greenwood and Tom Stryker would represent the city in those negotiations with the DOJ. And we reminded everybody, reminded the DOJ in that meeting that Tom Stryker was the police chief of the city of Cincinnati during one of the most brutal periods of police violence against people of color in any city in this country. And he was sued by the federal monitor because he wasn't living up to the terms of the consent decree in Cincinnati. This is who is negotiating on our behalf. And that's frightening to us. Certainly. I have a lot of faith in the DOJ. I have a lot of faith in the lawyers who worked in the civil rights division. And I have a lot of faith in the lawyers who are engaged in criminal investigations with DOJ and with the FBI. I think they're in it for the right reasons. But if we don't have a, a broad and vocal constituency of people in this city that demand transformative changes at APD, there's nothing that the DOJ can do. There's nothing that these changes will be than reformist. And we reform won't work. We've had plenty of reform. We've had waves of reform. We've had decades of reform of APD. We've had training manuals thrown out and new ones brought in. We've had leaders thrown out and new ones brought in. Right? We've had standards raised. We've had standards lower. The only thing the same is that they've kept killing people. So the DOJ is an important part of this process, and they are going to force the department to make changes that nobody else could force that department to make. And those will have a significant impact and save lives, no doubt. But unless, unless we hold the DOJ's feet to the fire, unless we give them the political power in those meetings, because there's people in the streets and there's people packing the city council meetings and there's people throwing politicians out of office who try to get in the way, until we can do that, then the DOJ report will just be one more report in a history of many reports that tell us there's a problem and offer us solutions, but end up at just producing more police killings. A long time ago, a long, long ago, the University of New Mexico uh, played a prominent role, like I would say most universities in America, in ending a war that 
that everyone believed was illegal and immoral and uh, completely counterproductive and, well, actually, a moral catastrophe. Um, and that was, a, that was a time in which philosophy professors, English professors, history professors, um, artists, uh, all kinds of writers on campus, everybody came together and had a public voice and were, I would have to say, more or less supported by the university. Um, not quite as strongly in the, in the, the mid-70s as it as happened in, in the 60s when Tom Popejoy went down to the American Legion in Hobbes and uh, defended uh, academic freedom uh, to the American Legionnaires alone. Um, but still, the university has a long history. Universities in America have a long history of uh, participating in social justice movements and in supporting and defending freedom of speech and uh, civil disobedience. Uh, so I'd like you to talk a little bit about uh, where you think we are right now on our campus, uh, where, you think, uh, where you think we could be, and, um, and, what, and what your philosophy is about that. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's been quite a week for me. I had a, uh, charged with a felony battery on Monday, and then the following Monday I was awarded tenure from the University <laughs> of New Mexico. So I think in, in some ways the fact that uh, the University of New Mexico, after a, long, a lengthy process where I was, I was uh, evaluated according to standards that every member of the faculty is evaluated by in terms of scholarship, uh, in terms of teaching, and in terms of service to the community, um, that they award, that's significant. I think it's significant that the University of New Mexico awarded me that tenure and was not, it didn't blink in the face of these uh, uh, charges that have no merit against me. And that's significant. Um, but at the same time, I think that I was disappointed at the statement from my president, UNM President Bob Frank, after the, uh, this felony arrest at a peaceful protest, at a protest struggling for justice for families of victims of police brutality, in which it's, he said, I don't represent the University of New Mexico, um, and I'm just a, a private citizen engaging in private political activities, and therefore it's a First Amendment issue, and that I would that, that the university would be monitoring the situation. And that, that's the extent of the statement the, that the university made. And it included a link to the faculty handbook section titled Separation of Faculty. And that was the university statement. And it was disappointing to me. I understand why they made it. And the university president has been very clear to me and to others that I don't represent the University of New Mexico in these activities that I, these political activities I engage in. And I've thought a lot about that statement, and I've thought a lot about my role as a professor in the university, and in the weeks since this arrest, I've thought a lot about the relationship between the work I do as a professor and the work I do as a member of this community. And I've come to the conclusion that there's no difference between any of them. And I've come to the conclusion that if I don't represent the University of New Mexico, who does? I represent the University of New Mexico as much as President Bob Frank rep represents the University of New Mexico. And there's been many good things that he's done as the president of the University of New Mexico. And there's been many things that he's done that I disagree with. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that he represents the University of New Mexico. The Board of Regents hired him to do just that. But the faculty in my department hired me also because to them, I represent the values of the University of New Mexico. And the University of New Mexico gave me tenure because I represent the University of New Mexico. And here's, here's how I represent the University of New Mexico. Part of my research is on social movement struggles for justice in New Mexico. It focuses very much on the problem of police violence and the problem of laws of violence, and the way in which communities organize themselves to defend and protect themselves against these patterns of state violence. And there's a long history of it in New Mexico. And my book focuses very specifically on, on a number of such movements in New Mexico. And my teaching does the same thing. I'm teaching my students to think critically about the world they live in, to focus on questions of social justice, and to learn how to ask the uncomfortable questions that nobody wants to ask. But then when you ask those questions, now we're obligated to answer those questions. 
And we have to have the, the, we have to do the difficult work to answer those questions. And sometimes professors ask and answer those questions in libraries and lecture halls. But our work as professors don't end at the edge of campus because sometimes the answers to those questions happen in the streets. And when those social movement struggles are happening right now, and there are people dying in our streets, and I'm writing about it, and I'm teaching about it in my classes, and I'm saying, what's right about this? What's wrong about this? And what ethical obligation do we have as faculty, as students, as administrators? What do we have to interrupt those patterns of injustice? And what can we do about it? And sometimes professors don't just belong in the libraries and in the lecture halls. Sometimes they belong in the streets, standing in solidarity with families, who are struggling for justice for their children who've been killed by police. And that's where I find myself now. And that represents the University of New Mexico as much as anyone else that represents the University of New Mexico. And I personally believe that I'd rather have that kind of representation for the University of New Mexico than a representation that allies itself with the military industrial complex or with the Department of, in of Energy, or with the Department of Defense. To me, universities should be, and can be, and must be, bastions for academic freedom and the First Amendment. These are the only places where we get to ask the most difficult questions, and no one throws us out for asking them. These have to be the places where we ask questions that no one else wants to ask, and then we answer them. It's not about objectivity and neutrality. Let's forget about that false notion of objectivity. We're after the truth. We're truth seekers. And if the truth is there's injustice, then we are obligated to do something about it. And if we're not, then that's just the same cowardice that we find in an administration that refuses to honestly confront a problem they wish would just go away. You know, it's not as if, um, it's not as if the University of New Mexico medical school didn't represent the University of New Mexico and all of its physicians who work in rural New Mexico work work on reservations, uh, uh, work with the disadvantaged all the time. It's not exactly as if the professors who inhabit the School of Architecture and Planning and work work with rural communities and other things don't represent the University of New Mexico. It's not as exactly as if poets who, who uh, run workshops and teach all, all over the state don't represent the University of New Mexico. Well, of course they do. Virtually everybody, even street people like me with no tenure, represent the University of New Mexico because we're all trying to do our best jobs for the students of New Mexico. Um, so um, I think you're on real strong ground here. I mean, I think everybody who operates out of that place, uh, a place that I love deeply, uh, represents us. So um, I'd like just to talk just one more second about this relationship between truth-seeking and teaching. Um, and I'm going to shut up and I want you to talk about that a little bit. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's not a question that's often answered, <laughs> much less asked. You know, I, I am, I'm not just a professor at the University of New Mexico. I'm also a graduate of the University of New Mexico. And I have a master's in community and regional planning. And I had the absolute priv pri privilege to work with professors like Claudia Isaac and David Hankel yeah. and others. And, and, and Teresa Cordova. And I was taught when I was in that program to serve my community. And this is a program entirely organized around serving this community. How do we best do it? What skills can we develop to bring to that community in service to that community? What are the politics around serving your community? Right? How do we interrupt patterns of injustice? How can the university play a role in that? And I think that the School of Architecture and Planning is a great example of a, of, a, of a unit at UNM whose entire mission is devoted to service yes. to this community. And if anyone represents the University of New Mexico, it's the people that are going out into communities and asking, what, what do you need from me? Yeah. How do I help you? Right? That's how I was trained as an academic. Or, you know, the, sort of the rural medicine programs that are trying to reach out to communities in New Mexico and identify young people who wouldn't ordinarily have the opportunity to become doctors so that they could go back to their communities and serve their communities as doctors, nurses, physician assistants. If, if, if that's not about serving the community and if those people through that don't represent the community, then nobody does. And 
And let me get to the question you asked about the relationship between truth seeking and teaching. I think that um, I, there's really only one thing, one thing that motivates all my teaching, and that's teaching critical thinking. I, I, I'm every class I teach, every lecture I give, every discussion I facilitate as a teacher at the University of New Mexico is all toward helping my students developing their ability to think critically about the world they live in, to recognize truth from falsehood, to recognize power, right, from truth, and to figure out how to ask the right questions, to figure out how to judge arguments against one another, right? These are not easy things to do. And so I organize every class around that. Now here's the problem. <laughs> here's the real problem. Once you gain critical thinking skills, you can't go back. Once you start looking at the world critically and you start recognizing injustice and you start recognizing the problem of the world we live in and you start talking about ways to fix it and you start talking about how do we develop an egalitarian society? How do we develop a society that serves everyone? And when you start recognizing ideologies that serve the few against, uh, as opposed to the many, but present those themselves as something that's for justice, then you, I think you have an ethical obligation to do something about it, to take a stand against it, to say that, no, this approach, this way of organizing society, um, turning over decision-making to corporations, um, limiting democratic access to our government, those sorts of approaches end up serving the few at the expense of the many, and we have an ethical obligation to do something about it. And the question then becomes, what do we do about it, and how do we do about it? What, and how do we actually put that into action? And those are, that's a whole other set of questions. And in this case, I joined a broad coalition of people and organizations, and I'm just one of thousands in a growing movement seeking justice that decided this is the only way to do it. We can no longer just seek recourse through official channels. We can no longer hope for the best. We can no longer just, just ask our elected representatives to do the right thing because those have never worked. And so we made a decision to move toward struggles that include civil disobedience. And I've written about those struggles and I've, I've spent years examining those histories. And I know, um, and I know why those decisions were made in the past and I know that the decisions about when to move toward a struggle of civil, civil disobedience is right. And to me, this is, this is the right choice. This is the, we're on the side of justice in the struggle and committed to nonviolence. And we recognize that if we just hope for the best and if we rely on reform and if we commit to a process that has always failed us, then we're going to get the same results, which means more people are going to die. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm tempted to say bravo, and I will. Thank you very, very much. It's been a wonderful hour, and I hope to have you on again in the future, and thank you, Anne. You're welcome, and it's always a pleasure to be on Insight New Mexico, and I hope the next time I come on is, is a conversation about the transformative change that this movement produced. <laughs>